Inside Improv with Stacy Halal, Joe Bill, and special guests Orla McGovern and Nicole Blue. Right. Hi, everybody. It's Friday. It's Inside Improv. So excited. We took a little time off and now we are back. Uh, you know, the weather was really nice. Everyone was outside. And now, at least here in Portland, it's really hot. So everyone's back inside or everyone was outside. <laughs> everyone's back inside. Uh, at least I am. So welcome. I'm so excited about our guests today. Uh, Elise is not here today because she's in Minneapolis for the Black and Funny Improv Festival, which is amazing. Uh, but I have my old friend Joe Bill here. Let's bring Joe Bill on. Hi, Joe. Hi, Stacy. How are you? I am doing okay. I am That's... so excited we moved to a house with air conditioning. Yeah, because it's high Tom Bensel. Um, <laughs> because it's a hundred degrees in Portland. It is a hundred degrees. It's gonna get up to 108 and 112. It's this is not what it's supposed to. We're supposed to be a temperate climate here. I've uh, I've managed because we have Irish guests uh, today. I've, I've managed to have Irish weather in Chicago, so it is 74 degrees, overcast, and slightly rainy. That's great. That's what you love. This is, That's what I love. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'll bet if I found a lighter patch of gray, I could get still get sunburned. I bet you could. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, without further ado, let's bring on our lovely guests all the way from yes. Ireland. Uh, we've got Orla McGovern and Nicole Blue. Uh, for those who don't know these wonderful people. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Orla is an improviser and performer and artistic director of the Moth and Butterfly Storytelling and Improv Collect uh, Collective. You may know her uh, from the Improv Fest Ireland, where she's been a big part of that. And also, we have known each other for 20 years. 20-something, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> and, wow. and in direct contrast, I am now meeting Nicole Blue for the first time. Welcome, Nicole. Hello. So great Hi. to have you. Yay. Nicole uh, is a musician and a writer, a storyteller, and does lights and sound for improv shows, uh, which is so amazing and such a gift to everybody. Welcome both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So happy to be here with Yay. friendly Yay. faces. <laughs> <laughs> so it's late. It's it's 930 over there uh, in yeah, Ireland at the moment. 930. Um, but it's still pretty bright out. We're on the west coast is, of yeah. Ireland. We're in Galway. And uh, I was telling you guys earlier, we just went for a swim in the Atlantic. So just to wake us up and be nice and fresh and we're having a cup of tea. So we're doing all the stereotypes at once. Just <laughs> <laughs> That's what we look to you for. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> cheers, cheers. And you said you swim all winter. So are you somebody who likes to do those kind of polar bear dips in cold water? I think it's more for me, it's more um, just for my sanity. I need to kind of get into the sea and the sea is very healing for me. So I don't necessarily do. Some of my friends will go twice a day or, you know, they'll drop their kids off to school and they'll go for a dip. I'm not that hardcore. I'll probably go like three times a week. And I like to just, you know, dip around and have a little swim. But I'm not like the marathon polar bear person. I'm somewhere in the middle. But it's cold. <laughs> yeah, it's it's cold. Yes, yes. <laughs> and Nicole is kind of recent. You're kind of recent to it, Nicole, because you 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 were terrified of it. You know. Yeah, I had a phobia of the sea, um, which which Orla has gently and most of the time, not so gently sometimes, um, <laughs> helped me helped me get past. So now I go. I am not a daily winter swimmer at all that you know that's a, when i grow up that i'll be that but, but yeah, a couple times a week all year long yeah do you do you mind if i ask do you know the source of your phobia it was it just the lack of exposure or bad experience bad experience so i um I try to make a sh long story short i was living in hawaii and <laughs> i had a huge crush on this girl 
And um, she was a very, she's from Long Island. She was a very strong swimmer. And she, in turn, <laughs> was with a guy who was a very strong swimmer. There's this reef about 100 out from Honolulu, from Waikiki. And at low tide, you can go well, out. Just and a second and go back because I think we lost and, the first part of the story, yeah? Uh, just the part. So, so she in turn uh, was with this was with guy, guy who also was a strong with swimmer. Guy. Yes, yeah. And there was a, like this reef meant built to keep out sharks because I don't know if you know Waikiki Beach is man-made completely um, with sand from California, just factoid. So anyway, reef and low tide. You go, you swim out about a hundred yards, and you can stand on the reef, and it looks like you're walking on water, and everybody's like, "Hey, look at me!" So. I arrive to the beach. She actually calls me and says, hey, we're on the beach. Let's go. So I go down to the beach and then she goes, ha ha. And she swims out with the guy to the reef and they go, come on, come on. It's safe. It's safe. It's fine. So I am not a strong swimmer. Never was. But I work my way laboriously out to the reef. And just as I get there and stand up and the tide is coming in, by the way, they go, ha ha. And they swim back. <laughs> so here I am already exhausted from swimming past my sort of ability and the water is rising. The tide is coming quite quickly because oh it's a man-made beach. Yeah. <laughs> so so what there's nothing nightmare. for it. I, yeah, I have to swim back. There's nothing else to do. So I'm swimming back and swimming and my swimming was like a dog paddle, you know, and I'm like desperately, desperate. I'm shaking. My entire body is shaking. And I think I'm going to drown in Hawaii, oh. <laughs> just yards oh. from the beach. Oh. And, and I, I was really struggling and I look up just as my knees hit the sand, a sandbar, and I look up and the lifeguard is like on tiptoes, like spotting me, like ready oh. to come out. I was that. I must have looked like that girl is drowning. So I was terrified to go yeah. out of my depth from that point on until two years ago when when I jumped into very cold water in Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. That's an incredible story. Did you still have a crush on her after she did that to you? <laughs> that crush wore off rather yeah. quickly. <laughs> I bet. I bet. <laughs> I you bet. grew up just a little bit that day. Just yeah. a little bit. I feel like there are certain things like horses, like horse riding, water, uh, bikes, bicycle riding, like that if you, and performing, uh, uh, that if you do them when you're younger, you, you never get quite that fear built up. But if you don't do them when you're younger, it, it's very hard as an adult to overcome mm. those fears. Uh, I, I remember, yeah. and I, I grew up in a pool, like, you know, I grew up in a pool, basically. Uh, every <laughs> summer, my mom would drop us off at the club for the, they were our babysitter all summer. But when I came to Oregon, you know, there's, there's natural water. And uh, same thing, I watched a bunch of people swim across a river. And I didn't realize how much, how strong the current was. And what's amazing was the moment that I realized I was unsure that I have the strength to go through it like the voices that came up in my mind like and and I think this is related to like all fight or flight right I was like you never finish anything like every like, every, every, every demon voice started talking me against being able to do it and I just had to to push through and, and made it across but I remember it very distinctly oh, yeah. That's so sad. I know. <laughs> but I made it. I made it. And in, in Chicago, we'd jump in the water once a year uh, in the spring when it was ice cold. And there's this moment where your breath gets taken away. Mm -hmm. And then you come out yes. and then you get that breath. And it, it, it is a reborn kind of moment that's amazing. Yeah, it's that yeah. guy, Wim Hof, you know, I don't know if you've heard of him, this guy who does all this ice swimming and he talks about like turning the, the, the good, the fat into brown fat. And he talks about, you know, all these. So there's all these like people in Ireland, like going running up mountains in the snow in shorts and stuff like that, because it's kind of the new it became the new thing. And then, of course, with lockdown, sea swimming just became this 
massive thing mm. in especially the west coast of Ireland and then there'd be you know this dr- people in dry robes you know these big kind of furry um, almost like a toweling robe it became like this yuppie status symbol <laughs> so there's like there's all these signs in parts of Ireland with like no dry robes allowed <laughs> like, like get in there in your swimsuit and you know get a towel come on don't spend 200 euro in a dry robe anyway but it's it's, it's all in <laughs> good fun as well i love that there are signs that forbid it like no too boozy (laughs) for this beach i love it (laughs) so uh so speaking of lockdown where is ireland now in pandemic opening reopening phases um in the irish Um, language there are there are no words for yes or no and um, that'll just give you a little bit of an indication of where our government <laughs> is at the moment. Um, I'd just like the moment to say that explains a lot about me that I never understood before. Yeah, well, there you go. <laughs> Thank you for that. Show. No problem. Um, so, yeah, I'll explain. I'll go into the grammar of that later. But so we don't really know where we are with travel and there are no theaters allowed to open at the moment. Cinemas are allowed open um, with a little bit of distancing. So there's a bit of a disconnect. There's no the pubs are open at the moment for pubs and restaurants for outdoor dining only, which in Ireland can be a little bit problematic as you can imagine. And there's lots of canopies and umbrellas springing yeah. up all over the west coast of Ireland. And um, we don't know what's going to happen. We suspect in the next week there's going to be more announcements. We thought we were going to be able to travel after the 9th of July, but we suspect they're going to roll back a little bit on that. We have one of the harshest... Um, I suppose if you're coming into the country, they went from having one of the most lenient to one of the harshest uh, restrictions. There's a mandatory hotel quarantine for certain countries Mm. where you have to pay them to stay in these particular hotels or you can self-isolate as well, depending on which country you're coming from and, and that you've had a test or whatever. So we don't know what our kind of autumn and winter is going to look like, particularly for the arts. It's, it's hmm. quite challenging at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. They've, um, when they've told the pubs um, that when they do open, and we still don't know exactly when that might be, there's no live music allowed. So as a working musician, that's just like, ugh. And that's oh, for the no. foreseeable future. Yeah. Is that because singing so, uh, projects more, you need more distance basically than. I, I think it's because, um, although I did read that somewhere, but it's more because with some, with the volume up in a pub, people will shout oh. to be heard. Yeah. It's no so loud music I think or loud the, music. Or, or loud, loud music. music. Yeah. Oh, wow. So are, are you having vaccinations happen or? Yeah, yeah, yeah it, um, there is a vaccination rollout and Slow. they're doing it mostly slowly, but they're doing it by yeah. age groups. There's obviously some people who can't get it. There was a big kind of a thing where, and I don't know if it was the same in the States, it seemed to be a little bit different where you could be called, but you didn't know what vaccine you're going to get or you mm-hmm. couldn't choose what particular vaccine you're going to get. And then there was sort of the whole thing with AstraZeneca being yes and no and yes and no. And every country was saying, well, I've got it right. I've got it right. So I think they're at like they're they're down in the 30s or 40s in the normal vaccination routine. Do they call you by age? But there's a lot of exceptions to that. Like if you've traveled or like I was in Dublin when it was happening in Galway. So there's lots of things that can kind of screw that up a little bit but for the most part the rollout is is happening yeah okay yeah wow it's incredible it's just uh it's so hard to know and now people are getting vaccinated here and people are like when are you opening or okay we want to come and do a show and uh, we're not at that 70 percent here yet uh we're getting close but we're not there and then you know with the variant the delta variant you could still catch even if you are vaccinated you can still catch it even though it won't be as bad i still don't want it right so uh (laughs) it's it's really hard it's a hard world to navigate right now it's a hard and i think the narrative from being on improv chat boards which is where i get all my news from these days (laughs) 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 yes yes But it's been a really different narrative about even, you know, the science of the vaccine. It's just been an absolute, um, when you chat to my American friends, it's been an absolute that, look, if you're vaccinated, you're not transmittable. And whereas in Europe, the narrative 
in our mainstream media has been a little bit more you're you're more likely to be um less contagious but it's you know the science is not as black and white so even just on our in in the narratives between countries how are we supposed to travel to each other's festivals we can't agree on these like simple things, mm-hmm. particularly Ireland and the US, because we have such an exchange, you know. Mm-hmm. And then obviously, you know, even within with mainland, we're not really Europe and Ireland. Sometimes we call ourselves we call ourselves non-Europeans because we feel, oh, are we part of Europe? That's <laughs> great. We, it's like it's a new thing. Of course we are. But we're like, oh, thank you. I forgot you invited us. <laughs> But especially, you know what I mean, especially a connection with the UK as well. And then also there's all, you know, so we always feel like, oh, 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 you mean Europe as in us. Oh, I get you now. So because we're, we're a land, you know, we're an island unto ourselves as well. So it's just very complicated. It's it very is. Complicated. It is. And we, you know, we're running our auditions. Um for vaccinated people in person so we had uh, we had 120 people come out uh all all vaccinated but there's some people uh in our community who are choosing not to get vaccinated and now we're left with um these competing priorities between privacy safety Mm um and and just an inclusion Right. So Mm -hmm. how do we include everybody without endangering some people and how do we keep people safe without uh, excluding some people? And and how do we communicate to allow people to make a choice if somebody chooses not to get it but doesn't want to share that with everybody? So it's it's a tough world to to be in. Uh, But. How did let's just switch gears now and just I, since we have you two here specifically, how, how did the two of you meet? How long have you known each other? Ooh, 17. It'll, it'll be 17 years in December. Nicole Amazing. knows the real facts. I have the fictional facts in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's that thing where it's like, oh, I've been doing improv for 18 years. And I say it for three years. And then I realize, oh, wait, no, I've been doing it for 21 years. So I skip, you know, years. So of- Nicole is my partner. We met in Seattle. And uh, yeah. yeah, the rest is kind of history. I, I have to say I knew Joe Bill before I knew Nicole. And I knew Stacy before I knew Nicole. So there you go. There you go, yep. Nicole. <laughs> Rule of threes. Yeah. I didn't realize you met in Seattle. I thought you had met yeah. after you had. So you were both living in Seattle. Nicole's an yeah, Oregonian, I'm, I'm Stacey. A, I'm oh, an Oregonian by birth. No way. Yes. I did not yeah, know that. I, I was born in Forest uh, Hillsboro, actually. Oh, okay. Amazing. Yeah, in the hospital. Yes. Incredible. So, yeah. I'm an Oregonian and there's, I meet a lot of Oregonians. Oregonians like well-traveled. Well, and also <laughs> so I think the, the Ireland is exactly the same, right? We can leave home yeah, and be in yeah, exactly the yeah. same place. So. Yeah. <laughs> just as wet, just more castles. That's right. Yeah, I really connected with, uh, I have, like I love Seattle as well, but Seattle, um, I think Portland was a little bit more, I don't want to say grungier, but it felt a little bit more down to earth than Seattle. And yeah. I think Seattle was changing a lot when I lived there. Yeah. So at the times we came down, Stacey, when you invited us down with some shows or we just came down to visit, I just was like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bit more home here now. So I totally, And we're yeah, totally to fine you. with you calling it grungier. You know, I think okay. we, we enjoy that, that part of it, that we're, we are more down to earth. I feel like Seattle has gotten very professional with the tech industry yeah. in there. Sure. And yeah, Portland has, uh, and obviously, you know, most cities are uh, upscaling quite a bit, but, um, but Portland does have that like little bit seedier uh, and we're just smaller. I feel like Portland's the, the youngest child in a family that includes Seattle, Vancouver, and San Francisco. Okay, lovely, very <laughs> nice. Of I'm actually seeing the youngest child with like ripped pants and a little patch on her knee. Totally, yeah, and just like a punk <laughs> ass who's still gonna get taken care of by everybody else. <laughs> 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 yes, so, so we so we met there. We met in Seattle, and um, then eventually, at some point, we decided we we'd visited Ireland a bunch of times, and mm-hmm. we went back, and we kind of decided to move back. So. We have been back here, Nicole, fact person, 
tell me. <laughs> Since 2000, September, s- September 2007. Yeah, it's when we moved back to Ireland. And, I've, yeah. you know, we've been back yeah. to the States a couple of times as well. But, yeah, that was kind of the big move back. The big move back. It's a giant move. A continent and an ocean. Yeah, what, what, what inspired that for you? Um, some of it was family related and some of it was, I mean, Nicole had always wanted to live in Ireland and I had nothing against Ireland. I liked it quite a lot. <laughs> I spent a lot of years there. <laughs> so I think just for me, um, even artistically and where I was going with, with my, my theater work and whatever, I just felt like, um, I felt like I, I would have more time to breathe here if that makes sense i felt like i was cramming everything Mm. into so much work and then the focus was work rather than breathing and uh you know much as i love the work i was doing and and my friends there and i really missed them terribly um i just felt like yeah it was a time for a change of scenery and i honestly i actually missed the physical west of ireland even though I'm, i'm originally from dublin i missed just this landscape um loved seattle it's really beautiful but sometimes there's a connect there's kind of a kind of an earthy connection with the place certain places um that i i can't you know it's not about the visual i got that with finland though as well like when i was landed in finland i felt really home so it's not about where you grew up necessarily that that makes it Mm -hmm. home you know no i I grew up in massachusetts yeah. And I have no idea, you know, what the calling, I, I just was called out to the Pacific Northwest, moved out here sight unseen when I finished college. Like I went to college, like I'm going to go to college in Chicago, then I'm going to move you know, to grad school in New York or LA and then move to the other one. And, uh, and then went to college in Chicago and was like, I got to get out of the big city. It's smelly and gross. <laughs> and, just, <laughs> and Chicago's a great city and I, I do love it, but I need nature around me. Uh, and then I felt, I, I believe that somewhere in a past life, I was a black bear that lived in interior <laughs> British Columbia. Oh, that's that's nice. somewhere nice. in my DNA. I, <laughs> I, tell you, I, lived, I lived in Worcester, Stacey. I don't know if you knew that. I, I didn't Worcester, know that. Man. So what brought you to the United States in the first place? Oh, or like? So I did a show. I did a show, a th- theater show. So I I started out as a little girl who was an actor um, in scripted plays. Uh, I did a theater show that we took to the Edinburgh Fringe Festival many years ago, and it won... Um, a Scotsman Fringe first. It was this really amazing show, a really powerful show. And um, a theatre director from Massachusetts, from the Forum Theatre, wanted to bring it over, but could only afford two of the original cast. That didn't cause any problems at all, by the way. <laughs> no. right? I think so- there's an episode of The Brady Bunch where that <laughs> happens, where like they just want Greg and not the whole band, right? Is that-, yeah. that episode is called the Johnny Bravo X. <laughs> <laughs> well imagine that like and double the cast and then you have the same thing and uh yeah so i went anyway i went i went to uh to worcester massachusetts and then the rest of the show was cast there it was an all-female production and the rest of the cast was there and we did the show there then i ended up in a relationship with one of the crew and um then we kind of moved to ireland and then we moved back to the us again and then i moved to seattle so it was sort of this like strange journey of things how i ended up in in worcester and i i I think i worked in it like a vegan restaurant in shrewsbury one summer shrewsbury mass as well so uh, amazing. These aren't glorious <laughs> towns in Massachusetts. No. <laughs> oh <my gosh. laughs> are, they're, they're great they're people, lovely. you know. Yeah, if it's just like a little rough and tumble, you know. Industrial Worcester areas. has a brilliant like blues bar called Gil Rains, and like hmm. it's 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 a whiskey drinking. You will see the best blues outside of Chicago, maybe I don't know, but some amazing <laughs> like the touring. <laughs> I know I'm just poking Joe. Um, <laughs> you know, we have great lobster in Chicago. Yeah. Probably the best lobster. <laughs> we have hot dogs in Ireland. Yeah. yeah. What? 
<laughs> in Minneapolis, there was a lobster restaurant. It was just all lobster. I was like, this is the weirdest thing I've ever seen in my entire life. <laughs> Giant Mississippi River crawdads. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm gonna look. I'm gonna look up Gil Rains later and see who's played there. But it was one of those venues, you know, that like really good names would go to. And that's the saving grace I'm pulling out yes, of the hat. Yes. I'm like, have a great blues bar, Stacy. <laughs> <laughs> amazing that's amazing and then we met at the seattle improv festival i believe that's how you and i uh, w- or was it the regional one that andrew put together was it that one where there was a i i think we met so i was in seattle goga yes and i don't know if we, i thought we met outside of the festival but it's all a blur this was the the 90s oh. everybody yeah and uh but we could have we could have met there and then um you did some shows in seattle and we guested with you i remember that i remember flying from ireland specifically to come to a show in belltown to i'm not joking i got off the plane oh. got up straight on stage I uh, didn't really know what I was doing, but I remember that so vividly. It's one of my favorite improv memories <laughs> of like getting off a plane and going straight to the theater. Well, and when we, you know, back then it was rare for women to work together, right? Like it, it, when when you are the the underrepresented group, uh, it, it tends to create a a, comp- a competition, right? Like, oh, there's only one spot you know a little bit like your theater situation right like there's going to be a team it's going to be all men there's going to be one woman so we see each other as competitors and it was very important to me um to work against that and so i was in a group called uh all jane it was all jane no dick at the time it was me and uh deanna moffett and and goga was girl girl on girl action action yep uh all girl group so yeah we did it at the jewel box and then Mm -hmm. then we did our first like until you and i reconnected story chain i had really not thought about that we had done a little mini all jane i've been doing all jane comedy festival all women here in portland for nine years uh but i did a little mini one and it was orla and jill bernard and a bunch of, uh who else and and we figured out that sean landry wasn't there but she did sean landry wasn't there pam man was there yeah and um ham hocks yes and <sighs> and they hocks. were the reason we went to it was sean landry's inspiration that we went to a, a sex club here in portland that I oh yes please tell this story right now <laughs> It's not as bad as it seems. I live. So I have to just. Yes, go go ahead. ahead. Go ahead, Orla. No, you go. Um, I just remember. So Seattle Goga was five of us at the time, and we knew one of our members, Sarah, couldn't come. She had a family thing on. So that we were down to four. And I think the day we were leaving, two people got sick. And we had, Pam and I had never done a duo show (laughs) together. Like, this was a new thing to me, a duo show. So we came down, and I, she's like, don't worry. Pam was great. She was the experienced improviser of the two. Don't worry, it'll be fine. And she's like, we're just going on a road trip. So we got down there. It was great. We had a great, really dark show, Pam and I, which was really fun. And then I think to recover from the the sheer trauma of doing a two-person show, I was like, we're going out. We're going out. We're going out in the town. And you were all like, yes, we did it. So I think we might have gone to a bar. We wanted to dance. I think we wanted yes, to dance. Yes, we did. And by the time... By the time uh, we got to the, when we would dance part, everything was closed except for. Uh, Ace of Hearts, Ace of Hearts, which was right up the street from me. And and I had known it was there forever, but I'd never been in it. And it was so classy. The signage for it was a piece of plywood painted white that someone had even just freehand painted a heart and the word Ace, like not even nicely done. Uh, And we go in and... And you have to. Well, we had to buy membership. Yes, you have to for but it's that for but it membership. Was five dollars, five bucks to yeah. be a member. Which was but a we, lot back then. Yeah. That was a lot. <laughs> and we all got cards. And, and who is this? The two of you, and who else? Um, Pam, Pam, and uh, um, uh, some two blonde people. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> was Jill with you? Yes, Jill Bernard was yes. with us. Jill and from Ham Hocks, I'm just totally blanking. Oh, on. Um, it was it was uh, lovely. Uh, I'll think of her name. This is what from happened. San it was the 90s. 
Zabeth? No, not was Zabeth there? Zabeth no. Russell? Zabeth was there. I she, think was she was there. Oh my yeah. god. Yeah. Yeah, Zabeth was there. <laughs> yeah. This is an all-star. Zabeth lineup. Russell, that's right. Oh, it she was, was there. It was just just the best group of people. And yeah, so we get our membership and we walk in and it is not ho- hopping. You know, it's it's pretty empty. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we go in and I think I remember and Orla, you'll have to cry. The first room I remember has a hot tub and some people in having sex in a, in a hot tub. So we, we walk by that and then so I it remember could be just it could have been looking for something they dropped, though it was that kind of sex. <laughs> that, that, was yeah. that was in there was like another room that had like porn playing on the wall and there were just two people in there and that's where I think someone was looking for something she had dropped. Uh <laughs> That happened to fall between the <laughs> toes of a man sitting down. So we walked through that, and then uh, and then there's a section where there's these rooms that are just beds, kind of high up, and uh, they have a little door, but each door has a little window, and there's a curtain, and they can choose whether they want to close the curtain or leave the window open so you can peek in and watch them. And then we or get... Or leave a note for the milkman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then we get to to the dance floor. There's a DJ and nobody dancing at all. So we just start dancing and we're having a good time. But then everyone kind of emerges from oh, the woodwork. It was woodwork. like Shaun of the Dead. It was like Shaun of the Dead. <laughs> they, they were, were like lurking fresh, out of the room. Fresh And there was like, there was like <laughs> tiny <laughs> cows on <laughs> large people, you know, <laughs> just kind of thing. And it was... I think we had decided to get a little wild and some people had taken their shirts off and were dancing in their bras and like slowly people's shirts start going back Because <laughs> we weren't there for the sex. That was it. We just no, wanted yeah. to have, a, you know, a good time. We weren't. And I think the DJ might have played some okay songs. I think we were yeah. actually, it was, you know, there was ABBA or something. I can't remember what we were dancing to. There was a bit of disco. But I think we ended up, and Jill reminded us, they gave us a lo- um an extra large Barbie. I don't remember, Do you remember that. Anything about this? J- well, Jill Bernard has this. We came home with a large Barbie. Oh my God. <laughs> what? <laughs> I, maybe it was some sort of demonstration model. I don't know for one of the rooms, but we ended up with it. I don't know what happened. That is so funny. I, it was dank and dark, you know, and chlor- yeah. chlorine smell from the two Ooh. hot tubs. Like it, it was. And there were these. There were. I remember the mats. There were the. You said beds, but I remember. You know those horrible gym mats that are in like really old gymnasiums. I remember a pile of them, and there was sort of like one falling off. Like help me, help. Chris, 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 Chris Wald is coming. Out. Chris Wald the large Barbie. <laughs> what we did. It was so fun. Oh and and the theater where we had the festival was called, uh, it was called Common Ground, I think, you know, it's a pretty common name, but it was a coffee shop with a little theater in the back. And we would yes. always rent that theater, but the coffee shop would be closed and the bathrooms were in the coffee shop. And I don't, you know, could not possibly have been legal because they wouldn't give us the key to let people into the bathroom. So it was a totally bathroomless little venue in a great little neighborhood but uh that's that's where we held it. i did a lot of shows in that space especially with deanna and we you know my first time orla doing a duo was uh all jane no dick originally was a, th- a trio mm-hmm. and we did uh, we were very green all of, you know uh, and especially me i think i was the most green of the three of us uh, but i was the most ambitious so like applying to festivals and we got into the Chicago You're the best. You were like, <laughs> it's like this woman is either a genius or has no idea what she's doing. That's exactly. So here's here's the proof of that. Oh. We got into the Chicago Improv Festival. Uh, great time slot opening for Bass Prov. And one of our members like just was uh, has had some trauma. And so she was it was all getting triggered by the stress of of this opportunity. And so this was the last time we all three performed together. But we opened for Bass Prov and Mark and Joe are like, oh, who who are these chicks from Portland? And I had, you know, super short punk haircut. And uh, and so they're like, we got to watch this. So they come out and there's a scene 
uh, with Deanna and our other player, and they're in bed, and they're, they're, the scene just gets caught up in a negotiation about having sex or not having sex, and they're just talking, and it's not going anywhere, and I'm panicking, and, you know, I'm a video editor, so I'm bringing at least, like, this sense of, like, that's kind of the intuition I brought was, like, shit's gotta move! So uh, I'm <laughs> panicking. So I dive under the chair between uh i think it was deanna's legs deanna's legs and in my mind we were a, a, a threesome and i had been under the blankets waiting for things to move along so i dive through her legs and i pull the blankets and i say hey are we gonna get on with this or what but everyone in the audience thinks i'm a talking penis <laughs> <laughs> It's like the most brilliant move I've ever made without having any idea that's what I was doing. <laughs> and Sutton, look, Mark Sutton looks at me and goes like, we need to take these girls on the road with us. <laughs> and like that cemented our bond with Joe and Mark. We got a great review that talked about how this brilliant move of then there was this talking penis. Like we just rode that. Like what, what better way to start your improv career than with a mistake oh. that like, like works for you so In instant remote annoyance theater cast member like, <laughs> you're, 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 the first our missionary work is, is was done it was yeah yeah it so was that's what led to hilarious all. it comes out of that oh the 90s oh the 90s did oh the well uh oh are you frozen are you there are you there you go i think you're on frozen on my back yeah. yes okay um, no, I was just saying that show you did in the in the the rendezvous that I joined, and I think I was coming from the airport. And um, I'm up on stage, and I think we arrived late, or maybe it was coming from the airport. But we definitely arrived late, and you kind of brought us straight up into the show with you. And and you said, and now we're going to start off with some personal monologues. And I didn't know what that was. <laughs> I just didn't <laughs> really know what that was. I was doing like improv. I was doing shows when I shouldn't have been doing them. So I was like, I'm oh, we're just going to talk about some objects. Okay, I'll talk about an object. But I just stuck. It was such a terror moment that stuck into my mind. But, but there's such joy attached to that terror moment. So it must, yeah. have been, must have been cool. Yeah. And w so then we got into the New York uh, we got into the Del Close marathon and we got a 730 Saturday time slot and we were right wow. after mother, I think, which was like the hot team at the time. Like people are pounding the 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 their feet and screaming. And our third drops out like a week before. And I've never done a duo in my life. And Deanna and I look at each other and we're like, we're definitely going to still go. But we decide not to rehearse because if we rehearse as a duo and it doesn't go well, <laughs> then we're going to come in from a bad place. So and then my sister, who is the only person for a decade who has seen any sh me perform at all at that time, uh, she, she came in from Boston to see me. And so we're doing and then Matt Besser's there just ignore like pulling kegs around like just totally in our little space that we're trying to get in the headspace and mother's killing it we're doing our first two-person show ever and we go out to do the show and i think you know it was very uneven we had a couple of really great scenes <laughs> we had a couple you know not so great scenes but i what i remember from that is my sister in the audience laughing uh because you know she's just loving seeing her little sister up there just doing it and so i could always i could just hear her voice through the the crowd yeah. and like that's what totally kept me going from getting completely overwhelmed and that was at the original theater on 22nd street right it yeah this is like the, the first this is this yeah. is literally 2002 i don't know if it's the first del close or the second uh, oh but, yeah that like, was like really we walked to ground zero and like looked at because it's right after yeah, yeah. uh 9 11. yeah uh in the whole city it was fourth of july so the whole city was empty and we got to like live live as if we were the only two people in new york because everything's open but everyone who lives in new york is out having barbecues and so we got all wow. this attention and i wore my all jane no dick t-shirt so everybody's talking to us about that it was it was a really special trip and 
I was making these little, I don't know if you remember me seeing this. I've made these little packets to put on all the chairs uh, at the Chicago Improv Festival that had candy and candy necklaces and it had all Jane magnets and uh, bumper stickers and I put it on each chair before our show. And so in New York, I shipped a bunch of shit to assemble the stuff. And Deanna's like, doesn't want any part of it. It's too stressful. <laughs> She's like kind of pissed that I'm doing it. <laughs> And especially because Del Close, it's group after group. There isn't like the audience empties and comes in. So it's like, what are you going to do with these? How are you going to do this? I was like, I don't know. I'm just going to make them and we'll bring them and we'll see what happens. So we leave them in the green room because we realize there's no way to do it. And then we're watching ASCAT, which Joe is in. And everyone starts coming out with candy necklaces on. <gasps> and oh, they're I'm eating the stuff. And Joe, it's because you told... Not Besser, but um, uh, the other man. Ollie? No. Oh, oh, Walsh. Walsh. You told... So somebody... It's probably Kevin uh, is like, what the fuck is this? Somebody back there is like, what the fuck is this shit? <laughs> and thank God I have Joe Bell in my corner. Joe Bell goes, oh, these are my friends from Portland. They're nervous. Da, 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 da. <laughs> I'm pretty sure, though, this was the night that we killed screw puppies. This is this is when <laughs> Ascat killed screw puppies. Yes. And Mark Sutton was furious because it was it was a handful of screw puppies. And then it was just going to be like Besser and Amy and Walsh. But then here comes Ali and Horatio. And then it's and this candy turns into this assault. Like we're, they're throwing candy <laughs> so at the Walsh audience. So Walsh ends up throwing them all to everybody. So yeah. it's like we got kind of... Um, like cred from the UCB four because they're throwing out the all Jane shit. And so then Deanna yep. turned to me and she went, okay, I forgive you now. <laughs> <laughs> but and that was, goes, yeah, that was like, yeah. this was after the annoyance had closed, the big theater had closed. Mark and I were doing Bass Pro, but we were still kind of keeping screw puppies alive. And so, and, and so... Uh, because this was not a screw puppy show, Mark was just livid. It's like, this is not a screw puppy show. That was not <laughs> screw puppies is dead. Screw puppies is dead. I hope you're happy. And I'm like, yeah, but all Jane and Bass Prov, we're, we're very much alive. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and it's a, I, I'm uh, at the very, like three minutes into the show, Polar like looks around and sees what's going on. She's like, I'm out. And she just bolts. And so now it's just like dude festival. It was all dudes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that, yeah. So and that had to be like 2002 or 2003. I, sure. You got to give me like 10 seconds to look on my fridge. I think I may have a fridge magnet. You got to give me like 10 seconds. I'm gonna okay. Go look. We will. I bet. I bet you do. That's so funny. Michael Gelman has one on his fridge. He collects them. Like, yeah, I, I've never, I handmade all those too. Like back in the day, it was, wow. I was broke. I didn't have the money. So I bought magnets with sticky. <laughs> and then at my job, I could, could print color because color printing at the time right was if, very expensive but I worked at an animation studio that had a ton of printers so I color printed and black and white you know printed all these things put them on and then hand cut hundreds of magnets there it is <laughs> yeah awesome. it's the origin story of all Jane fest uh, it is and then we had to change the name ancient like this has traveled with me across a continent Aww. That yeah. means the world to me. I love yeah. that. It's on page. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. And it, it was a great name for when it was three specific women. But then for the festival to be inclusive, we had to drop the no dick part because we include women who may or may not have dick. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. That, because the yeah. 90s were over and it's <laughs> a new dick. <laughs> yes. Well, yes. we knew we three didn't, right? So that was yeah. okay. But right. uh, but yeah. when you have a larger umbrella, right, you have to change the name. And it was still a little too yeah. soon for all Jane some dicks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, there's that time post 9-11 where we're just – you know, getting new ideas yeah. about like where we're going. For the first festival, <laughs> we did a little show uh, at the end, like a late night show with men that we called a little dick on the side. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow. God. Nice. Yeah. Great. So let's, Nicole... oh, sorry, go ahead, Orla. No, I was just going to say, I just remind Nicole, probably the first time you saw improv, I don't know, you probably saw stuff on UP, right? Yes, yeah, because because I went to um, high school the last year of high school just outside Seattle, um, in Linwood, um, and uh, it was a thing 
to for high school drama students to go on a field trip to see improv in Seattle. It was just a thing, um, which I now know is I was very lucky, you know, because it's certainly not a thing. And it probably is a thing in Chicago, I'd say as well, but it's certainly not a thing in a lot of places. So, but I, I just remember, you know, it was the, it was the, um, it was the gum wall in Pike Place Market. It was that theater. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Unexpected yeah. Unexpected production. Um, unexpected unexpected market yeah. theater. Yeah. And it must have been theater sports or something. It was a competition. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, so, of course, then I thought that's what improv was. I thought it was only competition. And so, somehow I conflated it in my brain with sports. And I <laughs> And I didn't think that I liked it because of that, because I was a serious serious performer right <laughs> i went to call it serious i'm very serious <laughs> i went i went to college for um theater first and then quickly realized that it was not my not my bag at all so then i switched to music but i was a serious musician i didn't do funny things no it was much too pretentious <laughs> for that <laughs> so, i was in my 20s come on serious mm-hmm. so um so yeah i i forgot i kind of left uh oh she's a little frozen uh, she well there would have been the wing more like the first sorry you just froze for one second so am i back you're... yes you are am i back yeah am <laughs> So, um, yeah, I think the first improv that I coming back was um, would have been the wingding before I met you, Orla. I saw the Seattle wingding. What's, yeah. a, what's the Seattle Michael's, wingding? It's, I don't know if it was actually called Seattle wingding. It was this, called the wingding. Was, sh- was it a Jet City? No, it was called um, Carlotta's, Carlotta's Night Night Wingding. Carlotta's, it was a yeah. show created by Troy Mink. Who you may know from um, Troy is a great performer. From part of the unexpected cast is also a musician, yeah. but he has an alter ego, had an alter ego called uh, Carlotta Sue Philpot, and it was a sort of part sketch, yeah. part improv show. And Jill Ferris from from UP was part of that cast, and and that's kind of how I ended up doing improv. I did everything backwards, and Nicole had seen that show before I even joined the cast, actually. So. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, Orla, you and I, like, like like, back then, everyone started with short form and it was rare to be someone to come at it from this other way. And, you know, I also was sort of a serious, pretentious, you know, anti short form person because of that (laughs) sports like, you know, gimmicky thing and then learned it was very much what I needed. To, to learn to lighten up yeah. and just have fun and to play a little faster and to remove my sensor. But, you know, I didn't do short yeah. form for very for forever. Uh, and I, I feel like and this is going to reveal a lot of assumptions and generalizations that I live with. So feel free to correct me. But I feel like uh, Jet City in Seattle was a lot more like a, what we expect from American improv. And UP has always had a more European sensibility where there's some while theater sports i think in general has more story first uh and jet city's great as well i don't mean to but it's it's fast and funny it was on a college campus whereas up is a little Mm. more experimental and there'd be more um form and some more sincere or serious moments is that accurate to and then and then also some inter like the international collaborations like the international festival i remember seeing some of my first like very arty i think it was i, I probably have worked with these improvisers since and didn't recognize them outside of the you know their the blue light on their face faces since in europe but they definitely in up um i would agree and then I mean, I have loads of friends who work in both theatres and then eventually they, they ended up kind of collaborating on a lot of stuff as well, or people would work in both casts. But um, yeah, th- I think that's a fair assumption. That was my impression at the time. This is more you and that's more mmm, you know. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. exactly. It's probably also notable that, that Randy Dixon, who runs UP, was I think kind of the first American that honored both Del Close and Keith Johnstone and then imagined what can we do if we sort of bring the schools together. Hmm. And and so, and I think he was the first one to sort of tour internationally and, and especially in Germany, I think was his, you know, his, his place. And to, um, I kind of feel like I follow in his footsteps a little bit. And where uh, Jet City 
I think was originally kind of a boys club that uh, UP had a little bit more of not just sort of European, but like a little bit more of an international um, bent to it. So you could see Harold's one night, you could see theater sports Mm -hmm. um, another night. And um, yeah. And even those two theaters, like it took a little time for them to just kind of warm up to each other because I think jet city, it was uh, uh, unexpected was there first. And then jet city was, you know, Christensen and Andrew and, you know, all of them, you know, well, being boys. And, 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 you know, back in the in the 90s and hopefully less so now, but still, I think in some smaller markets, right, people, people fear it, it's like a music venue opening a set, you know, somebody opening one and then someone opening a second and somebody freaking out like there's only enough people who want to see music for our one venue. <laughs> like we yeah. kind of have a real scarcity sense. Yeah, of- but it's like the side, I think the side projects from, from both the performers, I think that's almost what, um, maybe this, I'm ass- assuming this happened, but that kind of knitted the communities more together. I mean, you know, out of Jet City, a lot of, a lot of Neutrino came. Joe, you worked with, New, the yep. Seattle Neutrino project yep. and then I, I was working with The Edge and like um, yeah. Susan Mc, uh, McPherson and uh, a bunch of people came out of UP and you know Matt Smith who worked at The Edge in Bainbridge Island and Gary Schwartz who I worked with in the Spolin Players and then Gary was part of The Edge so it almost felt like we were hanging out and playing in all these other groups. Pam was part of the unexpected cast, Pam, um, Pam Man. so then we were like look we are all playing together in our other little, you know, yeah. and I think yeah. that's kind of when I think Jet City and UP started, look, we're all we're all intermarried now at this point. We might as yeah. well go to the same weddings, you know. <laughs> <laughs> the edge. Just- well, and for people who don't know, like the Neutrino Project is uh, an improvised movie with three teams, each have a camera a person who's also the director, a runner, the cast. So you, you're talking 13 people minimum each show to make it run so in a way it almost necessitates pulling on your whole community to be able to keep that cast uh full as many people as as you have and it's it's super fun joel dale was a big part of that joel uh, was joel was a big part of that i watched i found a dvd recently and mm. i watched it and i mean i was really shocked at some of the stuff we were doing i was like oh my <laughs> God. Like, and Nicole knows exactly what I'm talking about. I'm not going to go, but like, I've watched a couple like this. I found them. We just got a box recently shipped back. Um, I don't know if you know Sarah Rudinoff. She's was a great improviser too. She's a performer. She's a friend of mine, but she had a bunch of my boxes in her garage in Seattle. So she's like, I'm moving some of my stuff like 10 years later. Would you like some of your stuff? <laughs> so she sent me this big box and there's like neutrino DVDs and like, and I'm like, wow, just, but just seeing that time capsule that you know and we used to run physically run for anybody who's newer with technology we we shot these on mini mini dv cams and you had to like with a sharpie write the title of the the emotion of the scene on a piece of uh, duct tape on the tape and that would be run back and the tape would be played live i mean there was no broadcasting from your iphone you were running a physical tape from being shot straight into being broadcast in front of a live audience. It was nuts. It was nuts. And we used to have a live band. So we would also write on a sticky the mood or if we were like, there's no dialogue, so you're going to be scoring this entire thing. Like the runner would Mm -hmm. communicate just a little bit for those people. Uh, I would love to do it again. I can't actually figure out how to do it without tape um, (laughs) because you can't edit in your right your phone will make everything a separate clip so we have to figure out a way and we still we just dug out all the john john our tech here john tim and i you know we're just we're clearing out the whole theater before we open to start fresh but we're like oh my gosh here john was like what are these cameras <laughs> 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 Like, what are these strange? Things? Yeah, you know, there's. A, I also want to shout out Celine Ramadan, who is yeah. like oh, also mostly a Celine! musician, but just like she's kind yes. of like there's a parallel between you and Celine, Stacy, and that, mm-hmm. uh, that she's a Arabs. musician, but she's also yeah Arab, like you know me. 
I love my Middle Eastern. Women. I love you know? Celine. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. And, and who's who's like who has a, you know a great indie music career as well. But she was it's that same type of thing. And I think she has some old neutrino stuff as well. Uh, and she's moved back to Seattle from LA. So, and Justin Sund, and I mean, there's just a whole list. Justin oh, Sund. Yeah. And Destiny. Uh, Destiny, you know. that's who I was Destiny, trying. Yes, yeah. yes. Just a great Because they got people. married and became and the one's family. <laughs> it's amazing. So, and I think that that's where I, our, our kinship comes from, I think, Orla, is that I think we both love combining improv with other, right, with film, or as you're doing now with storytelling. Can you tell us about um, Moth and Butterfly and how that came to be and what kind of things you're doing? Sure. Um, I mean, I suppose, you know, Ireland has this this reputation, which is probably fair enough. Uh, we're a nation of storytellers. You'll go to a pub, you'll hear a story. We just have this tradition of mythology and storytelling. But I think it was in, in the US, I kind of really got into the moth, um, you know, the moth storytelling movement, personal stories and true stories. And I kind of wanted to take that back to Ireland. But it was almost like um, there's a kind of a thing with Irish people. They have a little bit of a block sometimes about talking about themselves unless they're making fun of themselves. It's <laughs> just this kind of a thing that happens. <laughs> but I really loved the truth and authenticity of that style of storytelling. And uh, so I wanted to start a night that was a little bit of that. But I also wanted to bring in a little bit of improvised story because I'd been playing around with improvised storytelling in different forms, obviously in improv. But I just loved the the, the notion of just doing a little bit of really story-based improv in front of an audience in a little kind of bite-sized chunk for people who had never seen improv. They might go, ooh, what's that? Because so many people in Ireland hadn't seen improv. So my idea was to start a night uh, that's called Moth, Moth oh, yeah, yeah. Improv, which is transformation, which I think that's what it is. We're transforming Spolin moment to moment, you know. And um, long story short, we started the night with a bunch of us who were improvisers or Nicole musician and storytellers. And we didn't know if it would work. And, you know, we just we here we are like 10 years later. We've been doing shows once a month. We did digital shows and it's just been something very special about the night. Um, this, you know, with, when Joe, when I came across Joe with Story Chain, I, just this light went, my, 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 my entire being lit up. I'm like, oh, my friend who I haven't hung out with in so long. We're on these like really parallel, we both set of these really parallel pathways with storytelling and connection and just bringing people together in this way. And uh, so we had our first digital festival in February with Moth and Butterfly. It wasn't intended to be digital. Um, and Joe was part of it with Story Chain, and we had uh, Jonathan Pitts came and taught a, a workshop as well. So I think we, we had a little bit more story heavy than improv, um, but that may change. It's our first festival, so we want to feel feel our way around it. I think what we will do is we'll have, if there are improv shows, they'll be very story heavy or story based improv shows and some workshops as we go forward, we'll we'll explore that. But um, I'm really excited about that. I'm also a playwright um, and, you know, and I work I work teaching with uh, a lot of different groups, like a lot of arts groups. And I the more I teach, I love combining storytelling and improv as two art forms together in in all of my work, I think. Absolutely. I love it, too. I, I feel like, you know, I because I was the youngest, I mean, no joke, um, of four kids, but also of all of my cousins. So when the family would get together, the, uh, the after dinner, right, the women would all be in the kitchen, uh, doing the dishes and cleaning up and prepping the dessert. And the men would retire to the living room and just tell stories. And my, you know, my dad's first generation, uh, American, but came from Syria and grew up in this, uh, Arabic enclave in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, uh, 
and the stories are were just unbelievable. And I was too, I was useless in the kitchen because I was the little one and there were so many women already in there doing everything. Uh, so I got to sit there and, and listen to the, the men tell the stories and, you know, until my grandfather would cry. And later I started having what I would call face orgasms where like I, I laugh so hard like that my muscles will all just go totally relaxed and then I'll weep. And like my grandfather, <laughs> used to just laugh till he would cry and you know and it's funny though as I'm older now it's like uh I've connected with my aunties and stuff and seen like oh they were telling stories like there was a whole other world in here that I, I always was like oh I don't I don't want to be the one serving right and doing the dishes and serving the men I wanted to hang out with the men but I was like oh they like what they're doing they're awesome too and so I I only in, in later life got to hear their stories and their points of view but you know, I think the Arabic culture, very similar background of like, you know, you eat dinner and you sit around and you tell stories. That's just what you Absolutely. do. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm going to Morocco. I think I was telling you earlier, I'm going to Morocco for the first time. I've never been to Morocco. I'm really excited. Um, and there's going to be a storytelling festival there in early February, right after our Moth and Butterfly Festival. So I'll have like four days to relax. But it's the World Storytelling Cafe. And it's um, it kind of took off during lockdown because a lot of the culture of even feeding the homeless in Morocco is based around um, restaurants being open and that, you know, that lovely hospitality with Muslim culture in Morocco, like, you know, giving food at the end of the day to people. And then there was they were decimated by the lack of tourism because of COVID. Mm. So a couple of these business owners decided to, you know, there was no COVID payments like there are in Europe or whatever. A couple of these business owners decided to keep on their their staff and to run digital programs um, for storytelling. So you have these people who are cooks and fabulous cooks and, you know, waiters and whatever running like storytelling <laughs> events on the internet. And um, people have tuned in from all over the world. It's the World Storytelling Cafe. It's wonderful. So we're having a real life festival in february and i'm so excited to go That's but it's open to anyone to go it's been held in the riads right in the medina so it's rather than one venue there's going to be these tiny little pockets of storytelling from people from every walk of life from england from Whoa. ireland australia the states so it's like an in-person story chain a little bit because you'll have like breakout absolutely. rooms basically yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, Fawad has a question for you, Orla, about yeah. what do you feel are some of the key elements of a successful improvised story? So I think it's a different answer depending on, on how you're presenting it. Um, in our particular night with Moth and Butterfly, we do sort of bite-sized, bite-sized stories. So we almost do, it's almost, we call it stories from a hat and it's almost like a sort of a, uh, a little bit nicer version of story, story, die. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we really want to show them the mechanics. It's broken down a little bit more than you would in a regular improv show. So we want to show the audience the mechanics. So we have somebody with a little tiny bell and they're just dinging this bell and they're kind of directing us almost like the pointer in story, story, die. But it's two people just picking up the story. So they're seeing the scaffold of like in the short form story, story, die. But what they're getting is a little bit more. You have generally two storytellers who know how to craft a story and they're playing with each other like this. So for Moth and Butterfly, generally we do that. We also do another version where we tell a story in two languages. Um, mm. It's usually Irish, the Irish language, Gaelic and English. Um, two of my Irish language fluent storytellers both had babies at the same time. So it kind yeah. of fell apart at once. <laughs> Um, as happens, but we we love to do that as well. So audiences are getting sort of they're getting something from the body language, and if their Irish isn't that good, they're picking up on that. But then it's being retranslated into English. So I think for the purposes of Moth and Butterfly, I think it's it's just like good improv. It's just being present, being connected, and listening. I mean, that's yeah. they're the elements for what we do in those little chunks. Um, I love, the, you know, obviously Ken Adams and, and versions of the story spine are really helpful for people building a story in a more kind of a traditional, a folktale way. Um, but I just love seeing people light up. I love people taking people by the hand and leading them on a journey. Um, but that's probably the way in lots of theatre and improv 
the same the same thing moment to moment as well. And I feel like uh, Fawad also mentioned that Syria is currently uh, uh, one of the richest uh, sources of storytelling because of the atrocities. I mean, my entire life, you know, Syria has, you know, from my grand the time my grandparents left and probably before, like Syria has just always been war torn. But you know, in the past decade, it's been uh, absolutely an atrocity. And uh, I think a big part about storytelling and, and improv that has made it so much more important and relevant is that people are not getting along, right? As we get into this world of scarcity and climate change and people in fear and hate are being, are festering, right? And, and being fostered mm. by this environment that knowing someone it's just i i had a stand-up friend who would always say you know it's really hard to hate someone who makes you laugh mm -hmm. and and i uh, yeah abs absolutely but it's really yeah. just for for i just triggered something there in my head um because we were talking about this at a storytelling conference and a lot of the storytelling traditions in mainland europe have been very fractured by the two world wars by and then interbellic times there weren't there weren't enough that like the stories were kind of lost and it's interesting like in a lot of arabic and also irish cultures there is this oral tradition because so many things books were burnt there was it was was an oral tradition and almost like that that's kind of kept this going where you know sort of uh text-based stuff was destroyed in europe with the wars and it's just it's really interesting um and also in first nations cultures as well there's that oral tradition as well so and you'll mm. often hear the same story echoed like in an arabic story in an ancient irish story mm. you know the same just the, the mirroring of it so it's that like really um you know really iconic kind of just living in the heart kind of root and seed of a story that when somebody just gives it to an audience it's it's you can't replicate that i mean my it's, my uncle uh no. who who we just lost i had always wanted to record him and it wasn't until recently that really i've had the technology to do it in a way that wouldn't be off-putting to him right and so I it's a huge regret in my life that I was never able to capture him telling stories he has this deep deep voice uh you know booming voice uh and you know shock white hair and his mustache and he was a barber and you know I think that was his venue because it like all the old you know Arab men all the Syrians would come in and sit around he'd be cutting people's hair but everyone would be telling stories in the barber shop and so that that was where he kept them alive and I I don't remember them enough and I just wish that so now I got to get my cousins cuz I know that that my cousins between all of us I think we might be able to reassemble some of those stories and it's a world that I don't think a lot of people realize like the Arabic enclave was within the black neighborhood of Pawtucket so in the in the in the rankings like because there's fewer right it was a, a mm. even more marginalized voice but so bizarre like stories of my great grandfather had a little shop and like would sell flies on a string did you ever ah. hear flies on it <laughs> it's like a like yeah <laughs> like instead of a balloon it's a, it's a poor kid's balloon is a fly tied to a string <laughs> To a thread. Yeah, I, think, like a... I think I remember my grandfather telling a very similar story that his father gave him instead of a puppy or something, it was a fly <laughs> on a string. That's really funny. Yeah. Which side, Nicole? Which side of your the the, the traveler side? So Nicole's Nicole's heritage on one side is Irish yep. traveler. So yeah. same as mine. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And we were like, that's not true. But he would insist that that was absolutely true. Absolutely and then, you know, true. Course, yeah. And we would run around looking for flies to see, yeah. you know, and never, <laughs> never succeeded. But John, did they freeze them? Is that what you that's how I did it. Yeah. I think you can put them in a freezer and, and then they, <laughs> they pass out. Then you tie the thread around and then they start buzzing. Oh, and then, you know, oh. then you have a toy. Unless oh and at Christmas, you get ladybugs on a string. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a great world. 
Yeah. Uh, no insects were harmed in the making of this book. <laughs> yeah. Oh. And you know, he used to work in the uh, in the fabric. You know, the weaving. He was a weaver and like would run the bo- when you're little you could run the bobbins between all the different looms and he was a child labor laborer when it was illegal so they would hide him when the inspector would come and he got injured and they just put his whole foot in a bucket of iodine because they couldn't take him to the doctor i mean this the stories are i i just have to see if what i can do you're inspiring me to make sure i i capture these stories it's just so and see how we have connected now you know your irish traveler side of your family and <laughs> my great grandfather from syria you know played in the same way and and like yep. how beautiful is that that's well, what stories do exactly yeah. and and i just feel like we just need it more and more uh right now and and just connecting people it's my favorite thing and joe so thank you joe for uh bringing orla and nicole here thank you nicole uh for being here so great to meet you always a delight i just want to kiss your face orla i gotta tell you like look at that face (laughs) you know we have the kettle on and your room is ready anytime okay you know and if joe arrives at the same time we'll put him on the couch it's fine okay fine fine, fine. fantastic (laughs) anything else you want to mention or talk about before we go uh oh i just maybe want to mention because we were talking about storytelling i i have a i have a an old lady character called Mrs. Nellie Murphy, which she actually came from. Uh, I want to sh- shout out Troy Mink in the Wingding as well. And I would love, I think Troy and I just miss each other so much. He came to visit me in Ireland a few years ago. Um, but he, uh, our two old ladies are going to get back together online. I think oh, it's it's not an official show, but we'll we'll put it up somewhere for people to see. Where should, where would I look <laughs> to find it, Orla? Well, Mrs. Nellie Murphy is on Facebook. Okay, she has great. a Facebook page. And and then, and then if she does something, she'll tell you about her friend Carlotta, and I'm sure we'll connect it up together. All right. Well, you are both so wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, I don't want to go. Like, I just want to spend the whole night telling stories mm-hmm. with you both, but we'll do that soon enough. So have a wonderful yeah. weekend. Thanks for being here. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Uh, we'll probably be here in two weeks. I think we're taking Fourth of July off. Yeah. Uh, so we'll see you in two weeks. Thanks, everybody. We'll be getting our stream. Love you all. Yeah. <laughs>